to be uh, welcoming Dr. Ezra Lee here to the University of uh, Manitoba to speak to us today. Uh, Dr. Lee uh, completed his PhD at a master in postcolonial literary and cultural studies where um, he began some work on a Korean comfort woman that he is continuing to uh, the literary narratives of Korean comfort woman that he's beginning to uh, build on today. He's got some research funding to, to build on that work. Um, he currently works at the Center for Locality and Humanities at Pusan uh, National University in Korea. And he's the incoming editor of their journal, Localities, that he will probably be talking about a little bit uh, today before he gets into the stuff that's on his talk. Um, his talk uh, today, he tells me, is based on a kind of long-standing, passionate interest in the writing of Pajin, Chinese uh, American writer who writes in English. So we're very lucky today, I think, to hear him talk about um, the novel A Free Life and some of the, the issues that uh, concern us at the, uh, at the research center uh, and more generally around questions of translingualism, uh, literary exile, border crossing, uh, and so on. So please join me in welcoming Ezra Lee. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, okay, as uh, Diana mentioned, um, I'm serving as the editor of localities uh, yeah, because of that I am always trying to 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 uh, bring many people uh, uh, to our uh, journal and then try to uh, help them to to send some papers or anything interesting uh, yeah actually the localities is basically uh, trying to see uh, local issues from a humanities point of view in general. Uh, basically, we are interested in any articles uh, that engage in interdisciplinary studies uh, in general, in, the, in, in, in any discipline from humanities, and also uh, sometimes social sciences too. Yeah, okay. Oh, that's it. Okay, today's talk is about uh, Chinese American writer Hua Jin, and his recent novel, A Free Life, Okay, so um, I wonder, have you, uh, many, any of you have heard about the term literary translingualism? Not really? Okay, yeah. That, okay, yeah. Then you can learn something about <laughs> translingualism from this paper, actually, hopefully. But actually, I don't know, actually, my reading of his book is basically uh, kind of a one way of seeing Hazin's. Uh, uh, struggle as a Chinese American writer, to him, to to whom actually English is a second language. So uh, that actually really fascinates me because I am, to me also English is second language. But I'm, uh, I've been studying English literature so far, and actually I also had had a kind of similar desire to to learn, in a sense, to master English. You know. Something like that, okay. Okay, I'll start. This paper examines literary translingualism, a unique characteristic of literary exile in Chinese American writer, Hazin's life and literary world. The trajectory of his literary exile is intriguing in the sense that uh, he chooses to write in English, his adopted language, rather than his native tongue, Chinese. The Tanamu massacre in 1989. Actually, he called this one massacre. Actually, some others also call used uh, uh, another term, but he called this one uh, massacre. Okay. Tanamu massacre in 1989 prompts him to decide to remain in the United States and commit himself fully to creative writing in English. He says, "I wrote my first English book between 1987 and 1988, but I thought this was just an excursion, and I would eventually write in Chinese." After 1989, specifically the Tanama massacre, I decided to immigrate and to write in English exclusively. Afterwards, I forced myself to write in the adopted language. 
end of quote. The Tiananmen massacre in 1989 marks such a significant turning point in uh, Jin's life of literary exile, uh, characterized as exiling himself not only to, into a new land, but also into a new language. In a newspaper article titled Exiled to English, Jin Fudu explains about his pursuit of literary exile. I cannot leave behind June 4, 1989, the day that sent me on this solitary path. The memory of the bloodshed still rankles, and working in this language has been a struggle. But I remind myself that both Conrad and Nabokov suffered intensely for choosing English, and the literature can transcend the language. If my work is good and significant, it should be valuable to the Chinese." End of quote. Interestingly, Jin relates his decision to leave as a literary exile to that of Joseph Conrad and Vladimir Nabokov, who made such a uh, great success as a literary exile, producing their literary work in their adopted language, English. By pursuing such a challenging goal as a literary exile in the footsteps of those two great writers, Jin defends his decision to write in English instead of his native tongue. Jin's literary achievement proves him to be a recognized and successful Chinese-American writer and important literary voice for Chinese people in the United States. And not only has he produced fine creative works, including uh, collections of poems, collections of short stories, and novels, but many of these works are highly acknowledged through the numerous prestigious literary awards he won in the United States. For example, the uh, Okay, I forgot the name. Uh, okay, World Trash, uh, which is about Korean War. Uh, uh, World Trash is, uh, was, uh, was selected the finalist for Pulitzer Prize, and also uh, actually many other, actually, many prestigious uh, awards he, uh, he got. Anyway, okay, Jin's success as a literary exile indeed places him as one of the significant writers in the tradition of literary exiles such as Conrad and Nabokov. Stephen G. Kelman terms such a literary tradition literary translingualism and elaborates on it in his groundbreaking work, The Translingual Imagination, published in 2000. According to Kelman, literary translingualism, the type of literary exile to another language, which is often caused by exile to another place, and subsequent amazing uh, um, achievements has a long tradition in literary history. Writers and intellectuals down through history have had to undertake their literary and cultural projects by means of languages of co uh, cosmopolitan centers or lingua franca instead of their native or first, first languages, such as Sanskrit, Latin, Arabic, Chinese, English, French, Spanish, etc. Complicated reasons, including economic, political, and aesthetic ones, prompts them to embark such a painful yet intriguing adventure of literary exile and translingualism. Jin also writes, uh, he says, in a, in a writer who migrates to another language, necessity, necessity, ambition, and estrangement usually come to bear at the same time. Uh, here, the combination of these elements uh, first one is the necessity of his, his economic and political situations largely caused by the Tiananmen massacre. Second, his ambition to become a great writer like Conrad and Nabokov and to give a voice to ordinary people in mainland China. Third, and the physical and psychological condition of estrangement largely caused by his exile to a new land and a new language influences Jin's decision making to pursue a life of literary exile in the United States. This paper gives particular focus on Jin's novel, A Free Life, for it has a significant personal meaning to him, particularly in relation to the pursuit of his literary exile and translingualism. According to him, the novel is conceived earlier in his uh, career in the United States and gradually develops while he endeavors to establish his career as a successful creative writer. 
Although A Free Life is finally published in 2007, it is originally inspired in 1991, just after two years when he made a firm decision not to go back to China due to the Tiananmen Massacre in 1989. In the early stage of his writing career as a literary exile, by a book of poems written by a Hong Kong immigrant who was a restaurant owner, in an interview, Jin you know, shares how deeply he was touched by his genuine struggle to pursue a dream of becoming a poet while managing the burden of a restaurant owner. He says, then I realized I would have to live through this process. Eight years later, I began to write. So not everything was planned, but there was always something there calling. I had to do it, end of quote. The first draft of A Free Life is pre prepared in 2000, and the novel is finally published in 2007. So the novel occupies a very special place in Jin's life of literary exile in the sense that it closely relates to his personal struggle with literary translingualism, and thus it also relates, uh, reflects his idea about literary exile and translingualism. My study on Jin's literary exile and translingualism through a critical analysis of his novel, A Free Life, in this paper explores an intriguing way in which the painful condition of literary exile and translingualism can serve as a powerful source of creativity in the trajectory of Jin's literary pursuit. This study also assists me to consider some characteristics of the aesthetics of literary exile Jin pursues. Okay, second part, here I basically I'm going to try to talk about uh, the, the, uh, some, of, uh, uh, some ideas from uh, Stephen G. Kellman about literary translingualism and then also uh, Hajin's own ideas about the same topic. Literary translingualism, according to Kellman, is the phenomenon of authors who write in more than one language or at least in a language other than their primary one. People are forced to all voluntarily pursue literary translingualism, just as Kalman points out, uh, he says, colonialism war, increased mobility, and the aesthetics of alienation have combined to create a canon of translingual literature. Here, the first two components can be recognized. First one, uh, such as colonialism and war, can be categorized as forceful conditions, and the rest two, such as increased mobility and the aesthetics of alienation, uh, uh, as uh, voluntary ones. So this kind of binary opposition is not necessarily unambiguous. To be exact, both aspects can contribute to people's pursuit of literary translingualism uh, relatedly and in complicated manners. Whether forcefully or voluntarily, those uh, who engage in uh, literary translingualism must endlessly reside and make a choice between languages. According to uh, Paolo Pohorquez, uh, such a choice is a difficult and agonizing one to be made. For, uh, according to her, translingualism includes a wide variety of linguistic choices, abandoned, dormant, uh, reinforced adversarial or uh, coexisting languages that constitute various ways of coming to terms with the predicament of linguistic multiplicity, end of quote. In this regard, literary translingualism undertaken either willingly or reluctantly turns out to become a pursuit of suffering and agony that requires tremendous effort and according to Kerman, is a tightrope act without nets. Jin also often mentions how difficult it is for him to produce a fine piece of literary work in an adopted language in his interviews or talks. The suffering and pain Jin has to endure in his pursuit of literary exile and translingualism is caused more by his linguistic exile to English rather than by his physical exile to the United States. This does not necessarily mean that his physical exile is something that can be uh, easily bearable. His literary translingualism through English obliges him to endure the harsh criticism by his own people that he is is an act of betrayal. Uh, actually, recently, actually, he he wrote a, a, a novel, actually, which is called 
kind of betray, betrayal, something like that, actually. Yeah. That's also another interesting topic. And also to go through an extremely painful process of creative writing to produce a fine piece of literary work in its adopted language. This type of literary pursuit, according to Jin, puts one in a painful but original position. The agony one has to experience in the process is part of the price he or she has to pay for his or her originality. Jin's description of Nabokov's suffering and agony in his pursuit of literary exile and translingualism delineates the pain and struggle Jin must uh, undergo in the process of uh, his own pursuit of literary exile and uh, translingualism. Uh, Jin cites, actually I really like this part, even though this is so painful, <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> and my, my complete switch from Russian prose to English prose uh, was ex extreme, ex exceedingly painful, like learning anew to handle things after losing seven or eight fingers in an explosion, end of quote. Uh, this type of literary pursuit requires taking a great risk of boldly walking onto an uncharted area and even with the fear of being a failure. Jin often mentions this word of fear in his interviews or talks. Jin's life of literary exile and translingualism as a whole shows how such risk and fear turns into a so source of uh, the motivation and energy for his creativity. In response to a question of how he managed to undertake such a tremendously difficult and agonizing project of literary translingualism and produce fine literary works, uh, Jin says like this. I guess fear is a big part of it. A writer in my situation is unlike a native writer or a Chinese writer. Once you write a good book, basically you are quite secure within a literary tradition. If your book is really good and valuable to the time and to the people in the culture. But a writer in my situation, we always stay on the margin. We can't leave this margin. Unfortunately, in English, there is a st uh, tradition established by Conrad and Nabokov, but still it is a narrow path, a very narrow path. So we have to be very careful and also I have a sense that we have to write a body of work in order to create a ground for ourselves. So that's kind of the source of energy. You have to continue. One book doesn't count. You have to write a body of work. So I think that's the major psychological drive, end of quote. Here Jin explains about the source of his literary productivity, that is about uh, how uh, his unfavorable situation as a translingual writer further motivates him to produce a body of work. This quotation also reveals Jin's passion for establishing himself as a writer in the footsteps of Cornet and Nabokov. His motivation here is more than just his pursuit of becoming a successful writer that can bring him financial stability and fame. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, okay. For the path he pursues is a narrow one that requires him tremendous efforts while enduring psychological pressure such as the one he characterizes. He characterizes in the word fear. What he says in what follows reveals the ultimate goal of his pursuit of literary translingualism. He says, I have been asked why I write in English. I often reply for survival. People tend to equate survival with livelihood and praise my modest, uh, also shabby motivation. In fact, physical survival is just one side of the picture and there is the other side, namely to exist, to live a meaningful life. To exist also means to make the best use of one's life, to pursue one's vision, end of quote. He, he further adds, therefore the writer who adopts English while striving to seek a place in this idiom should also imagine ways to transcend any language. In brief, Jin's pursuit of literary translingualism is, is closely related to the reason for his existence as a writer, that is his vision as a writer whose literary work can go beyond the boundary of the nation and the language. 
Okay, now uh, in, in the last part, in the third part, I'm going to talk about Hazin's uh, novel, A Free Life. Jin's A Free Life depicts the process of a Chinese PhD student named Wu's pursuit of literary translingualism in the United States. As I mentioned earlier, this novel is closely related to Jin's own trajectory of literary exile in the United States. So the novel contains many elements that can relate to Jin's personal similar uh, experiences. For example, in the novel, Jin shows how decisively and deeply the outbreak of the Tiananmen Massacre influences Nan's life in the United States and how it eventually leads him to remain in the United States and pursue literary translingualism. Jin also describes Nan as the one who persistently seeks his dream of becoming a poet who endeavors to write in his adopted language despite unfavorable situations he has to go through. In addition, many aspects of Jin's ideas elaborated in, in his book, The Writer as Migrant, are embodied through Nan's literary pursuit in A Free Life. In a sense, I, fi I find these two books are very kind of, uh, uh, these two are, uh, uh, complement each other. Uh, the, the novel is uh, like a fictional work and then the a collection of essays more like, uh, in a sense, uh, kind of theoretical. You know, uh. in, in, in short, the progress of the main character, uh, Nen's epic journey to seek literary exile and translingualism reflects Jin's own experience as an exiled writer who boldly takes up the burden of literary exile and translingualism. In this regard, my reading of Nan's pursuit of literary translingualism in A Free Life will allow me to consider some characteristics of Jin's pursuit of literary translingualism. Interestingly, Jin's depiction of Nan's pursuit of literary exile and translingualism is rather more about his agonies arising from his juggling in between his full-time job as a restaurant owner and the pursuit of his dream of becoming a poet. And, and in between whether he has to write his poetry in his native tongue or in his adopted language. The process of his actual labor for the production of poetry is not meticulously uh, described. However, writing journals and poems attached as, as an appendix at the end of the novel reveal the painful process of Wu's uh, creative writing in his adopted language. Almost at the end of the novel, Jin describes Nan's firm decision to pursue his literary exile and translingualism to the full. This way of Jin's description of the process of Nan's pursuit of literary exile and translingualism effectively serves not only to reveal the agonizing struggle anyone has to go through in pursuit of literary exile and translingualism, but also to defend his own pursuit of literary exile and translingualism. Jin's depiction of the trajectory of Nan's uh, literary exile and translingualism shows the growth of Nan's uh, consciousness as a translingual writer. Furthermore, this process also reveals how Nan's exilic consciousness and the aesthetics of exile get shaped and grows. From the beginning stage of his life of exile in the, in the, in the United States, Nen uh, keeps his desire for poetry writing, despite the financial burden he feels as he has to take care of his family. Yet his poetry writing in English instead of Chinese does not come to his mind. His awareness of literary translingualism grows very slowly and steadily. First of all, he, realize, he realizes the absolute necessity of learning English in order to settle down in a new land. This realization is made very clear, clear when he witnesses the old Chinese couple, uh, the former owners of his restaurant, who are still uh, 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 out of place after leaving uh, here for three decades, largely due to the language barrier. Nen and his wife, Ping Ping, thus make a further effort to learn their adopted language. Regarding Nen's conscious efforts with the new language, the novel describes as follow. Uh, he, uh, it says, uh, he knew that 
In this land, the language was like a body of water in which he had to learn how to swim and breathe. Even though he'd feel out of his element whenever he used it, if he didn't try hard to adapt himself, developing new lungs and gills for this alien water, he, his life would be confined and atrophied and eventually uh, wither away, end of quote. This metaphoric expression, expression in this quotation shows how absolutely necessary it is for immigrants like Nan uh, to learn and acquire a new language for their survival, and also at the same time, how hard it is for them to do so. Throughout the novel, Jin depicts Nan as the one who keeps a dictionary with him and makes a very conscious effort to pick up new expressions even while talking to his American friends. Nan's conversation with a friend of his, Dick Harrison, a full-time and professional poet, is quite interesting with regard to the growth of his awareness of literary transcendentalism. After hearing how Nan's poetry writing is going on and asking whether he writes in English or Chinese, Dick strongly encourages Nan to write poetry in English because his English has improved a lot. Nan, however, says that he does not know anyone who produced good poems in an adopted language. Dick responds that Charles Simic uh, uh, immigrated to the United States in his teenage years and became a great poet in his adopted language. Although there is no mention of such a term as literary transcendentalism in their conversation, Dick talks about a case of literary transcendentalism. And furthermore, he encourages Nan uh, by saying, uh, Nan, you should be bolder. Fuck the bunk that says you can't write poetry in your uh, stepmother tongue. If nobody can, then you'd, be, uh, better, you'd better be uh, try harder. That will put you in a unique position to make yourself original. To tell the truth, I was quite amazed that your English has improved so much. You speak more fluently than before, end of quote. Here, what Dick suggests is the intriguing relationship between Nan's attempt to write poetry in his adopted language and that it can uh, also serve as a source of uh, uh, creativity. This thinking is also closely related to what Jean and Kalman suggests in terms of the relationship between translingualism and creativity. One day, Nan participates in meditation with his friend Dick yet he can hardly immerse himself into it, for he is uh, distracted by the uncertainty about whether he continues to write poetry in Chinese or, or not. There is no news from literary journals in Taiwan where he submitted some of, his po some of his poems. He also submitted his poems to magazines in mainland China, yet they requested him to delete or change some parts due to political reasons. He cannot accept this type of censorship. This situation has led him to think that it may not be possible for him to pu publish his poems in Chinese. Furthermore, he feels deeply uh, frustrated, thinking that he may not become a poet in the end. Jin describes Nan's situation. Uh, uh. OK, I'm sorry. OK, Jin describes Nan's situation. Uh, it was as if in front of him stood a stone wall inviting him to bump his head against it. If only he had come to uh, America 10 years earlier, then he could definitely have given up his mother tongue and blazed his trail in English, end of quote. Thus far, Nen has made strenuous efforts uh, to fulfill his dream of poetic pursuit while doing his best to, to take care of his family financially. Yet he sees the prospects of fulfilling such a dream are getting dimmer and dimmer. At this deeply frustrating moment, quite interestingly, Nan, for the first time, seriously considers literary translingualism as an alternative, albeit uh, seemingly belatedly. Uh, later, actually, at the end of, interesting, at the end of the novel, uh, has in uh, as a poem which is called Belated Love, you know. It's, that's very interesting. Nen's experience of deep frustration, however, does not stop his poetic pursuit itself. Jin's following description is interesting. Somehow, two ancient lines cropped up in his mind. No prairie fire, prairie fire can burn the grass up. 
when the spring breeze blows, it will again sprout. Yes, yes, he must have the spirit of the wild grass. However thick and impenetrable the wall before him, he must grow beneath it and even on it, like the invincible grass with blades that eventually would dislodge the rocks. The rocks. This was the American spirit Whitman eulogized, wasn't it? Yes, definitely. He must figure out his way, own way of making poetry, end of quote. Despite the bitter, the bitter frustration he experiences, such strong mentality mentioned in this quotation sustains Nan and assists him to keep on his poetic pursuit and even drives him to spend more time in writing poetry. His Chinese friend and immigrant, Subo, cannot understand Nan's attitude, so they have a dispute about this. Subo argues that creative writing is only for the second or third generation of immigrants, and that Nan's job is to establish financial stability for the next generations, which can serve as the material foundation for the spiritual pursuit of the next generations. He even advises that if Nan really wants to pursue his dream of becoming a poet, it is reasonable for him to do so in Chinese. If Nan keeps on his poetic pursuit in Chinese, like many other Chinese diasporic writers in the United States, he may end up writing poems for readers in mainland China to have more readers and thus publish his poems in mainland China. This means that he would have to accept the censorship of his poems by the Chinese government. Uh, this type of com compromise, however, is not something he can tolerate. Actually, according to Hajin actually experienced this kind of censorship. He tried to publish his own works in, in mainland China, but only there, so far there is only one book was uh, published there because that was politically okay, but others are you know, rejected because of some you know, sens very sensitive issues. Definitely Hajin is against the, the current uh, communist regime, actually. Yeah. Okay, after deep and agonizing con con consideration about the direction for his writing, Nan fully makes up his mind to pursue his poetry writing in English. Jin describes Nan's decision and the path he takes. He says, he understood that by adopting another language, he might wander farther away from his Chinese heritage and have to endure more loneliness and run more risk Eventually, he might have to estrange himself from his mother tongue, in which a writer of his situation, in fact, all writers in the Chinese diaspora would be marginalized. But to write poetry in English was like climbing a mountain with a summit he couldn't see or envision. It was very likely that he might mess up with his life without getting anywhere. Still, was there any other way if he was determined to write? End of quote. However, Nan's decision does not fully reveal what is in his heart with, with regard to his pursuit of literary translingualism. One tragic incident finally uncovers what is, what is repressed deep in his heart. When Nan's wife, Ping Ping, uh, gets pregnant, Nan takes this opportunity as an excuse for him to keep reluctant to absolve himself into poetry writing in English. Nan, however, has to confront what is repressed or avoided when Ping Ping goes through, uh, in the end, miscarriage. The novel describes this situation like this. The truth was that he had, had been frightened by the overwhelming odds against writing in English, in English artistically, against claiming his existence in this new land, and against becoming a truly independent man who followed nothing but his own, uh, uh, his own heart, end of quote. Just as the prospects of the publication of his poetry in Chinese became so narrow, his spirit of not easily giving up uh, sustained him. In a similar way, in such a miserable situation when he lost his baby daughter, Nan's de desire for literary transsingualism gets more confirmed. Finally, toward the end of the novel, Jin describes Nan's firm decision and ideas about his life of exile and his pursuit of literary transsingualism after a long period of uh, agony and, and struggle. Actually, that's almost at the end of the novel, you know, uh, 618 page. Novel is actually almost 700, 
700 something. Yeah, it's a really long. Okay. <laughs> While sitting at the front desk in the small hours, he think about his life, especially about his 12 and a half years in America. Many things previously unclear to him had become transparent. The notion of the American dream had bewildered him for a good decade. Now he knows that to him, such a dream was not something to be realized, but something to be pursued only. This must be the true meaning of Emerson's dictum, hitch your wagon to a star. To be a free individual, he had to, do, to go on, he had to go his own way, had to endure loneliness and isolation, and had to give up the illusion of success in order to accept his diminished state as a new immigrant and as a learner of this alphabet. More than that, he had to take the risk of wasting his life without getting anywhere and of becoming a joke in others' eyes. Finally, he had to be brave enough to devote himself not to making money, but to writing poetry, willing to face uh, failure. Actually, the last part all of a sudden reminds me of the, you know, we talked about the relationship between humanities and the current uh, situation. Okay, that's, uh, but uh, here the Nan spirit is quite, you know, opposite, you know. Yeah. Okay, this quotation shows that Nan wants to pursue an American dream different from the American dream that many immigrants, including Chinese immigrants, usually pursue and hope to fulfill, and that is, predominantly based on a financial, financially stable life. His dream is pursuing literary translinguism. He knows that this cannot be easily achieved, but rather become something that he must uh, persistently seek. He thus knows that he may become a failure and a joke in others' eyes, wasting his life without fulfilling anything remarkable. Despite this risk, he wants to go this way. It is because this is the path of a free life he chooses to pursue. The pursuit of a free life through the pursuit of literary translingualism uh, is a truth. It's a truth Nan learns through his life of struggle in the United States. Nan observes that although many Chinese people immigrate or exile themselves to the United States for, for a better life, uh, uh, in the, what they virtually experience in the United States is an extremely difficult life, psychologically as well as physically. So Nen concludes that a free life is indeed something Chinese people must pursue and experience in the United States. The novel explains about the concept of freedom he learns. Okay, he says, freedom is meaningless if you don't know how to use it. We've been oppressed and confined so long that it's hard for us to change our mindset and achieve real freedom. We are used to the existence defined by evasions and negations. Most of our individual tastes and natural appetites have been bridled by caution and fear. It's more difficult to break the self-imposed uh, tyranny that the, than the external constraints. In short, we have lost the child in ourselves, end of quote. Here freedom is not only a state of being uh, free from external constraints, but also a state of being free from anything abstract that can make anyone feel confined or restrained. Nen, Nen learns about this way of pursuing freedom, freedom through his struggling life uh, for a long period of time in the United States. Although the pursuit of literary translingualism is a solitary and difficult path, and possibly a path toward failure, he realizes that this is the way of a free life for him to pursue. For it has the choice of his heart, and thus strives to pursue such a way of, uh, of his life journey, although it can be a way uh, toward failure. Okay, toward the end of novel, Nen even uh, sells his stable uh, restaurant business in order to give more time to be to his poetry writing and to find a, a night nice shift position at the front desk of a small hotel. Because after midnight, he is able to have a, a quiet time uh, for his poetry writing. Uh, writing. His owner owner later uh, suggests him a daytime 
uh, daytime manager position, but he declines it mainly because he ex expects that it cannot allow him to have, have such a quiet time and night for his poetry writing. In a sense, you know, uh, maybe, I don't know actually, some, to some maybe this sounds very uh, stupid, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, actually, but I, anyway, okay. That's what happens in the novel, in the novel, okay. The growth of Nan's awareness of and the pursuit of his life of exile and literary transingualism are also uh, closely related to the growth of his awareness of aesthetics. Here, aesthetic is more than his aesthetic consciousness, or consciousness to find beauty in things in the world. It is also closely related to how he sees life itself and his pursuit in his life. Then it's deeply inspired by uh, Ken, Kent Phillips' uh, paintings he comes across in an art gallery. The novel describes how Nan feels about uh, uh, this exper experience. It says, but Nan liked them very much, fascinated by their dark, luminous quality. In these landscapes, every stream, every tree, every animal, every rock possessed a, sh a shimmering spirit that seemed transcendental and mysterious. The paintings had depth and a kind of darkness that reminded Nan of the forest in New England. For the rest of the evening in the kitchen, he couldn't stop imagining a kind of dark poetry that possessed a luminosity similar to that in Kent Phillips' faint paintings, end of quote. Nan's attempt to embody this type of beauty in his poems becomes unsuccessful. In this process, he realized, uh, uh, quote, he, he knew that living in Georgia he, can, he couldn't possibly present that kind of landscape in his poetry, but he didn't have to avail himself of the physical world. What he should have was a restless soul from which uh, vibrant lines might originate, end of quote. Okay, just one more page, okay. <laughs> uh, the expression, a restless soul from which vibrant lines might originate is quite close that to, to that which Nan feels in the process of his life of exile and the pursuit of literary transinguism. Although Nan more affirmatively acknowledges and accepts this state of emotion toward the end of the novel, in, actual, in actuality, he has to deal with it from the beginning of his life of exile. And writing journals and his poems uh, attached at the end of the novel proves that such a state of emotion serves as a source of creativity for him. The following poem that appears at the end of the novel succinctly describes Nan's life of exile and his pursuit of uh, literary transingualism. Okay, this one is called uh, Belated Love. Uh, at the end of the novel, actually, Hazin uh, uh, puts this poem there. Okay, I will read it for you. So many years I wandered around like a kite uh, scrambling away from your hand that held a flexible string. How often my wings collapsed, soaked by rain or shattered by wind. Still I went on scouring the clouds for a face that might blow the shimmer of my brain into blazing lines. With a seeding heart, I wobbled, wobbled through the air, chasing a, a sublime haze. Now I am at your feet. No jest left in my chest, no wings. My wings fractured, my mouth forming regret. My words too jumbled to make sense. What I mean is to say, my love, I've come home. Okay. Nan says that this poem is written for his wife, Ping Ping, and 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 for the first and therefore the first time in his life, he dedicated a poem for his wife. As Nan suggests, this poem is a love poem, a definitely love poem, and succinctly describes the process of Nan's realization of his love for uh, his wife and their also th their relationship, love relationship. Furthermore, this poem is also about the process of poetry writing itself. And in this respect, it succinctly describes the process of Nan's uh, pursuit of literary transingualism uh, throughout the novel. Okay, I'll stop here. Okay. Okay.